It is now time for oral questions. I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's Loyal Opposition. Thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first uh, question this morning is, is to the Premier. The Premier is rewarding the worst people that have provided services in long-term care over these last number of years, the worst players in the long-term care system. These companies make profits off of the suffering of our seniors. They're being handed 30-year contracts and literally billions in public dollars that line the pockets of for-profit corporations. New contracts, Speaker, are an egregious, egregious uh, situation. These companies failed to provide the basics that our seniors deserved in long-term care. They're being rewarded for that bad behaviour, which is not only extremely problematic, but it's a knife in the heart to all of those family members who lost a loved one to COVID-19 in long-term care. So my question is, why does this Premier think it's okay to reward the very companies that neglected Ontario senior citizens in for-profit, uh, for rather, private long-term care homes? To reply on behalf of the government, government host speaker. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, obviously, uh, uh, what we are doing is uh, is continuing the build out of more uh, long term care beds across the province, Mr. Speaker. We knew when we came to office uh, uh, that this would be a priority for the people of the province of Ontario. I've said it on a number of occasions, and as has the Premier. Uh, the inability of the previous Liberal government to invest in this sector uh, is uh, certainly what caused some of the problems that we saw at the onset of, uh, of, of the pandemic, Mr. Speaker. We brought in a number of different initiatives. Not only, it's not only about building new long-term care in the province of Ontario, it's about adding, uh, adding care. Mr. Speaker, we are going to a North American leading four hours of care. Uh, daily, uh, Mr. Speaker, we are hiring 27,000 additional PSWs. We are paying for the education of a number uh, of, uh, of PSWs. So we know that there is a lot of work that needs to be done, Mr. Speaker. We are increasing uh, inspections uh, uh, across the sector, Mr. Speaker. But nothing changes from the fact that we need to get new beds uh, on this in the system, Mr. Speaker, and we are doing that over the next number of years. Supplementary question. This government's priorities, the first thing they did when they came into office was cut the inspections and reduce funding to long-term care. That was their priority, Speaker. And as a result, we saw what happened. A broken system under the Liberals was much, made much worse by this government, and literally people suffered unspeakable situations. People lost their lives because of this government's lack of the right priorities. The Premier is literally handing over to Orchard Villa, one of the very worst actors in this whole uh, nightmare, 733 new beds and over 1,000 redeveloped beds. That's the reward that Orchard, Orchard Villa is getting from this government after the armed forces went in there and unveiled the nightmare that was happening where 70 people lost their lives. That home did not face one single penalty. They were one of the worst. The government's own inspectors, and I quote, said this, basic care, including bathing, showering, oral hygiene, nail care, assistance with eating and drinking, and fall prevention monitoring was not doing, was not being done. Why is this premier rewarding his buddies in for-profit for -profit, long-term care instead of protecting our seniors? Uh, again, Mr. Speaker, just the opposite. What we're doing is building out, as the member highlights uh, in her question, thousands of new spaces across the province of Ontario. We have had, uh, we had a problem even before this government uh, was elected, but we decided prior to the election that we were going to focus on long-term care in the province of Ontario. That is why we initiated the, re the rebuild and the construction of 30,000 new beds, Mr. Speaker. It, it, there is still more work to be done. That's why we're hiring 27,000 uh, new PSWs. I know uh, earlier today the minister announced uh, uh, the, uh, the the hiring of, uh, of uh, hundreds of new inspectors uh, for uh, uh, to ensure that these new beds that we're bringing online, with the new inspections that are happening, with the 30,000 uh, new placements, the 27,000 new uh, uh, PSWs, with over 3,000 new nurses that are being brought into the system, that we have one of the most robust uh, systems Spons? of long-term care, Mr. Speaker. Four hours of care. These are massive investments that are being made. Should have been done decades ago. I acknowledge that, Mr. Speaker, but this government is getting it done. And the final supplementary. 
Oh, they're getting it done, all right, Speaker. They're literally pumping billions of dollars into a broken long-term care system that is giving the worst performing providers of long-term care, these for-profit corporations, even more public money. They've, uh, we already have in this, in this province, 57% of our long-term care beds are operated by private sector players the highest in Canada, and this government's decision after the debacle, after the horrors that happened through COVID-19 are going to bump that up to then 60 per cent with these announced, uh, uh, these announced investments. Speaker, CTV reported this just yesterday, and I quote at Orchard Villa, an inspection report from July. July 2021, just a couple months ago, notes the licensee failed to ensure the staff followed the home's infection prevention and control practices just a couple months ago the fao said that in 2021 the government Question. spends more than six is spending more than six billion dollars of our public health care money to line the pockets of their for-profit buddies in uh, in for-profit private long-term care homes why would the government pour billions of dollars into the same people that that cause such tragedy throughout our province during COVID-19. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, what we're, what we're doing is pouring billions of dollars into the long-term care system, investments that should have been made uh, by the previous Liberal government, Mr. Speaker. They weren't. They should have been forced upon them uh, by the previous NDP. Uh, who, as opposed, waited for stretch goals and insurance. So what we're doing, again, I'll, I'll be very clear, Mr. Speaker, we are investing to bring on 30,000 new spaces. We are investing to ensure that there's four hours of care. That is a North American leading uh, level of care. We are bringing on hundreds of new inspectors uh, uh, into the system, Mr. Speaker. The Minister of Health has been transitioning to Ontario health teams. Uh, speaker, so that we can have better infection prevention, infection prevention and control uh, measures, Mr. Speaker. But the the member is correct. The member is correct. For far too long, the investments weren't made in long-term care, which led to homes that were not up to the standards that we expect, standards that we are putting in place, standards that we moved on very quickly after being elected in 2018. Response. And we are going to rebuild homes. We're going to invest in new homes. We're going to invest in, in, in care. We're going to invest in the PSWs to manage that care, Mr. Speaker, and have the most robust system and inspections in Canada. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Speaker, my next question is also for the Premier, but we know exactly, everybody knows exactly what they're doing. They're handing more money over th to their friends in private, uh, for-profit long-term care at, into a broken system. They're expanding, basically, Speaker, a broken system. But my next question is about uh, the advice that the Premier has been getting from the science table, which is very, very clear. They say mandatory vaccines for health care workers just make sense, that it makes sense to, to have a mandate for vaccines for health care workers in our province. Let me remind the Premier uh, that this is exactly what the uh, science table said, and I quote, requiring that health care workers be vaccinated against certain communicable diseases is evidence-based and protects the public. So my question to the Premier is, when will he say yes? When will he say yes and bring in mandatory vaccines for frontline health care and education workers in our province? The Deputy Premier, Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker. And I, I think it's really important to note, Speaker, that this is not uh, a simple issue. There are a variety of views being expressed by the science advisory table and also by the many groups that the Premier wrote to to receive their uh, information, CEOs of hospitals, other health groups, to understand what the uh, results would be if a mandatory vaccination policy were to be brought in. If there is a concern that health human resources, which are already strained, our frontline health care workers are doing an amazing job and have for the last 20 months, but they are exhausted. Some of them are leaving for other reasons. Some of them may leave because they don't want to be vaccinated. We need to have that information. We ha are receiving the responses from all of those various groups, and we will put that all together, analyze it, and then make a determination on what needs to be done. And the supplementary. Speaker, it's really hard to understand why this Premier never just says yes to science. The Hospital uh, Association also weighed in about a week ago, and they said exactly the same thing, Speaker. I don't know why the Premier hasn't seen their letter. Maybe it's still on his desk. Julia. Hen Henningsburg, 
the president of Holland Bloorview Hospital for Kids Rehabilitation says this, and I quote, a universal vaccination policy across the healthcare sector is the safest approach for our patients and our teams. And contrary to what the Minister of Health just said, the science table said, a quote, a requirement can enhance safety and reduce the risk of staffing disruptions due to COVID-19. So now I guess the health minister is not listening to science either. The health care experts the premier asked for Question. feedback have given their feedback speaker. When will he listen and bring mandatory vaccines to all of our health care settings? Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, our government has been listening to science and clinical evidence since the beginning of this pandemic, and we will continue to do so. We listen to what the science advisory table has to say. We listen to our chief medical officer of health and all of the people that are advising him. We're listening to the CEOs of hospitals. We're listening to everyone. We want to understand what the ramifications of a mandatory vaccination policy would be. We know that if there's someone unvaccinated, it can affect other workers or other people in hospitals, but we also know that if if, they are, if there is a requirement for vaccination, some people will leave. We need to know how many will leave because we need to make sure that all Ontarians who are in hospital will receive the, the care that they require. So this isn't just a simple yes, no, do it. We need to understand what the ramifications will be, and we're analyzing that now. And a supplementary. Speaker, this is not the first time this Premier and this government have decided to ignore science or to pay lip service uh, to science uh, while they're trying to appease their anti-vaxxer base. The, at the end of the day, Speaker, the evidence is in. The experts have spoken. The, in fact, the worry is that if people take COVID-19 as unvaccinated folks into hospitals as workers, they could spread it to their co-workers. There's hesitancy because people don't want to go to work uh, if they think that their co-workers might be unvaccinated. There's risk that patients will become uh, infected with COVID-19 and outbreaks can occur with our most vulnerable. Everybody is saying the same thing except this government. When will they finally listen to science, finally do the right thing and make sure we have a vaccine mandate to protect our workers, to protect our patients, uh, to protect our families Question. throughout our health care system? Mr. Health. Speaker. Well, it's, it's very clear, Speaker, that our government has taken every step possible to encourage everyone who is able to receive the vaccine to do so. We've asked that. We've made it easy for people to go and receive the vaccine. It's available in many locations. We now have GoVax buses going to where people are and not expecting them necessarily to come to where the centres are. We want people to be vaccinated, and the vast majority of health care workers have already done that. But there are still some for a variety of reasons that are not choosing to be vaccinated. We need to understand how many there are, because we need to make sure that our hospitals will be able to operate, not only for all of our patients. We now have received nine patients from Saskatchewan as well who are in very difficult circumstances. We need to make sure that we have the health human resources that we need in place to be able to care for people. And it's also important to Spons. know that people who are not vaccinated are still tested very regularly to make sure that they do not have COVID. So we are protecting the health and well-being of all Ontarians. Next question, the member for Davenport. Mr. Speaker, good morning. This question is for the Premier. Speaker, last week, the Northwest Catholic District School Board voted unanimously to call on the province to mandate vaccination for all education workers. They followed boards like the Toronto District School Board, Ottawa Carleton, and Superior North Catholic, who have all taken matters into their own hands in the absence of leadership from this government. It has meant that families are left with a patchwork of vaccine policies in our schools, one that is leaving students with more or less protection, just depending on where they live in this province. Speaker, does the Premier think it's acceptable for unvaccinated school staff to work with our children who can't yet benefit from the protection of vaccines? The Minister of Education. 
Uh, well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank the member opposite for the question. We're proud in this province to have literally one of the highest rates of immunization for youth in the country. We're also proud to have one of the lowest case rates uh, for young people in Canada, and that's because we followed the best medical expertise of the Chief Medical Officer of Health. That is not a coincidence. It's because we put in a layered approach coupled with high immunization rates. With respect to our schools, we're very proud, Speaker, to have invested in air ventilation, a leading request and recommendation of the Ontario Science Table. Every school has improved air ventilation for mechanical ventilated, uh, as well as with the deployment of 70,000 HEPA units. Speaker, the logic of the member opposite to require that mandate would mean that we would potentially be terminating 50,000 workers in the education space. That's the position of the New Democrats to hire pink slips to tens of thousands of hardworking educators at a time when we are already challenged by staffing in the province of Ontario. I think we have to be coupled by Fox. realism, ensure that any staff member that enters our school has a double test, a negative antigen test, to ensure they are safe, to ensure our schools could be staffed, and these kids can continue to go to school every day. And you supplement your question. It boggles the mind, it boggles the mind, Speaker, why this government will not take this action that parents across this province, that boards across this province are demanding. Speaker, the news that Health Canada is finally reviewing vaccine applications for the 5 to 11-year-old age group is a huge relief to parents, especially considering that we surpassed 4,000 cumulative school cases last week. But given the province-wide scavenger hunt, a scavenger hunt that we saw with earlier phases, Ontarians are rightly worried about how they're going to get their kids vaccinated. This government has ruled out a pre-registration system like the one that BC created, and public health units, again, are being left to pick up the slack, or we're going to be left with this disjointed patchwork of plans. Speaker, why can't this government be proactive for once, Question. for once, and deliver a plan that will ensure a smooth rollout of vaccines for 5- to 11-year-olds? To reply, the Minister of Health. Well, thank you for the question. We have been very successful in our vaccine rollout for adults. We have one of the highest levels of vaccination uh, in, in the world right now. We are over 87.9% uh, of first doses and 83.9% of second doses. This has been successful. It has been successful in uh, reducing hospitalizations. We currently today have 269 cases of COVID in Ontario and 138 in intensive care. That includes the nine from Saskatchewan. So we are working on vaccinating children ages five to 11. We are in regular contact with the federal government as to when they expect that Health Canada will be able to complete the review and allow for it to proceed. I will have more to say in my supplemental about exactly what we're doing with respect to that age group. The next question, the member for Whitby. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. After years of neglect, where the previous government only built 611 net new beds from 2011 to 2018, the wait list for long-term care grew to over 40,000 people. Now, while I've heard the minister talk about our government's progress in building 30,000 new long-term care beds in Ontario, we know that we need innovative solutions to dealing with the wait list. Speaker, last Friday, I joined the minister in my riding of Whitby to announce an investment of $82.5 million to expand the community paramedicine for long-term care program to an additional 22 communities. Speaker, can the Minister of Long-Term Care please explain what this investment means for seniors on the long-term care wait list? Minister of Long-Term Care. I uh, thank the member for Whitby for his question and the great work he does representing his constituents. Mr. Speaker, the Community Medicine Program uh, for Long-Term Care leverages the skills of our paramedics who do such great work uh, in our communities focusing on supporting those who are waiting for a place in long-term care homes. Mr. Speaker, over the uh, two years uh, leading up to uh, our government coming into power, uh, the wait list increased by 11,000 people. And as the member noted, we have a plan uh, to build 30,000 long-term care beds, 200 and 
40 or 220 projects underway. But, Mr. Speaker, the additional $82.5 million that we announced last week expands now the community paramedicine program to cover all of Ontario. So all Ontario seniors who are waiting for a long-term care bed can now get the support of community paramedicine. That brings our total investment to $250 million, uh, serving all communities uh, across uh, Ontario with this vital support. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the Minister of Long-Term Care for that response. I'm glad to hear of the proactive steps that are being taken to provide quality care to seniors in my riding and across Ontario. Speaker, seniors in my community want the peace of mind to know that they have a safe option to receive quality health care without having to go to the hospital while they wait for a long-term care bed. So, Speaker, after seeing the stagnancy and neglect of previous governments, how can residents be sure our government will improve the health care outcomes for seniors here in the province of Ontario? Mr. Long -term care. So, Mr. Speaker, in, in the region of Durham, that 250 uh, million province-wide amounts to seven and a half million dollars to support our seniors through the community paramedicine program. And Mr. Speaker, what that means is access to 24/7 um, support. Uh, for, for our seniors. And I should say that that is in coordination with our vital home care services, uh, bridging this, uh, this uh, situation for seniors who don't have access right now to a, to a bed as we build them. It means home visits. It means in-home testing, ongoing monitoring. Um, and Mr. Speaker, as the uh, paramedics pointed out to me, it means a reduction in 911 calls because of the support that's being provided very directly to these seniors. So it helps support our seniors. It also so helps support our hospital system, and in doing that, supports our communities. Thank you. The next question, the member for Niagara Centre. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Ontario's domestic grape industry has a legacy we should all be proud of. Niagara's wine tourism industry attracts 2.4 million tourists and generates a tourism-related impact of $847 million annually. Growers have invested in research and technology to mitigate the risks of climate change. However, this year, our Niagara and Ontario grape growers are facing a harvest that is challenging at best and devastating to some. The weather conditions this fall are making it difficult to harvest the crop. Grapes are perishable and picked at maturity. They cannot be stored. Coupled with the difficult weather conditions, our Ontario-grown grapes are rotting in the field because they are competing with imports. This is a time when world supply chain issues and shortages are making headlines. But, Speaker, local grapes don't get stuck on cargo ships. Will this government stand up today and ensure that local growers aren't left behind while importers get a place on the shelf? Thank you. Government House Leader to respond. Well, Mr. Speaker, uh, the, uh, probably wouldn't surprise the honourable gentleman that. Uh, that uh, I too want to make sure that there is, a, is uh, always a good grape harvest uh, in the province of, on, uh, of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. This uh, maybe is a, an opportune time to give a shout out to my relatives who are actually in the process of making their own wine this year. But that's not to diminish the importance of this sector to, uh, to the province of Ontario, especially uh, in the honourable gentleman's uh, region. And uh, this is a sector, of course, the tourism sector has been very, very hard hit, uh, and we have put in a number of significant investments uh, into the sector to make sure that uh, uh, they can come out of, uh, out of this uh, more robust uh, than they went into it uh, before. I will take the honourable member's uh, um, uh, uh, comments, and I will be able to advise him a little bit later on. I apologize that I can't give him the appropriate answer that he's looking for specifically uh, to that uh, that industry, but I will uh, I recognize how important it is, and I will make sure that I endeavour to get back to the honourable gentleman at the conclusion of the question. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, we need the government of Ontario to stand up for locally grown grapes and the wine that is made from 100% Ontario grown grapes. We need Ontario grown to be first on the label and in the bottle, and no grapes should be left on the ground. Growers have a collective legacy of investment of an estimated $647 million in 18,000 acres of land and vineyards. It costs about $40,000 an acre to establish a vineyard and takes four years from planting to mature production. It is a long-term investment in our land base, with most of the vineyards located in Ontario's specialty crop areas of the protected greenbelt. 
This government has said Made in Ontario is one of the pillars of the COVID-19 recovery strategy. But what will it do to make sure Ontario grapes get into a bottle of wine that is grown in Ontario and on the shelf of the provincially run Liquor Control Board today and into the future? How long do growers and wineries have to wait to see action? Again, the government has uh, Again, Mr. Speaker, look, I will agree with the honourable gentleman that uh, there is uh, this is an incredibly important industry to the province of uh, uh, of Ontario, incredibly important uh, to his region. I would agree that uh, our grape growers are some of the finest uh, in uh, in North America, and that our wines, as a result, are also uh, the finest. We have made a lot of progress with respect to opening up uh, uh, our markets here locally. Uh, to expanding uh, the availability of, uh, of, uh, of, of beer, wine, and, and, and spirits uh, across the province of Ontario, something that the members opposite, of course, have voted against every single time, Mr. Speaker. So uh, uh, it, it is surprising, but I, I guess I'm somewhat grateful. The honourable member is now shifting the NDP. Look, earlier we had them shifting towards the support for the, uh, uh, the oil and gas sector, thanks to the great work for the member of Sarnia Lambton. And now we're hearing, finally, support for uh, our local industries, such as uh, our, uh, our grape growers. So I, I thank the honourable gentleman. More has to be done, and we'll make sure that it gets done so that this remains a vibrant uh, industry. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Simple Grape. Thank you. Uh, speaker, my question is for the Minister of Health. Speaker, last week the uh, CEO of Royal Victoria Hospital in Barrie announced uh, a new south campus to be built on a Greenfield, Greenfield site in Innisfil Township. The planned facility is to first uh, serve as a health hub, focusing on outpatient care, and then eventually expand to become a full-service hospital. Speaker, while this is exciting news for South Simcoe, it has many of my constituents asking how it will impact the timing of the redevelopment of Stevenson Memorial Hospital in Alliston. Stevenson received Stage 2 planning money 16 months ago, but has heard nothing since. Speaker, can the minister tell my constituents when Stevenson Memorial can expect to move forward with the next stage of its much-anticipated and desperately needed redevelopment? Minister of Health. Well, thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member opposite for the question, as well as for your uh, tremendous advocacy on behalf of the cystic fibrosis community. You played a major part in the uh, approval of Chicago, so thank you for that. Um, it is true we have received a submission from the Royal Victoria Hospital for a new South Campus, but uh, nothing has been decided yet. We're just in the preliminary review of their application. But as you know, having been in this position before, we've received numerous capital requests for hospital projects, and we are working through a number of them now, including the one from the uh, Stevenson Memorial, which uh, was announced in our 2019-2020 budget. We are continuing to engage with the hospital to advance planning for the first phase of the hospital's redevelopment Response. project, which is a major. This is an uh, important project, and we are taking the time working with the hospital to make sure that it uh, serves the purposes that the community needs. And the supplementary question. Thank you. Uh, back to the minister. Speaker, as I was uh, pleased to inform the House earlier this morning, the Minister of Health visited the Collingwood General Marine Hospital in August. Well, there she announced a $15 million investment to fund the next stage of planning for the hospital's future, and I sincerely thank the minister and the government for fulfilling that promise to come to Collingwood. But, Speaker, the second part of the minister's promise over the years has been that she will also tour Stevenson Memorial Hospital in the south end of my riding. This commitment is just as important to my constituents and will allow the government to see firsthand the desperate and I mean desperate, need for Stevenson's redevelopment. Speaker, can the minister tell my constituents when she plans to come to Alliston and tour Stevenson Memorial Hospital, and I hope she will, and will she be bearing good news when she comes? <laughs> minister of Health. Thank you. Well, I, I can't uh, commit to the latter part of your question. However, I know that the Stevenson Memorial uh, Project redevelopment is major, uh, leading to um, 
89,000 square feet and new bed capacity. So it is significant, I know, for the constituents in your riding, and uh, we want to uh, make sure, as I said before, that we take the necessary steps to uh, get it in the right space and the right place for all of the residents. And uh, while I can't commit to a specific time for a visit, I would certainly be uh, happy to come and tour the hospital when time permits, but uh, unfortunately I can't um, advise with respect to any announcements at this point, but uh, I certainly will attend if I'm able to, and thank you for the invitation. Thank you. Next, we have the member for Flamborough, Glanbrook. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and good morning. My question is for the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Mr. Speaker, the COVID-19 pandemic has accelerated a great shift in how we work. Today in Ontario, almost 30 per cent of people aged 15 to 69 currently work from home. While some constituents in my riding of Flamborough-Glanbrook have enjoyed the flexibility that this offers, they also worry about their days getting longer and longer while time with their family is getting shorter and shorter. Mr. Speaker, will the minister please share with the members of this House how the Working for Workers Act will help hardworking parents who feel burnt out? Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Great. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the a member from Flamborough Glanbrook uh, for that very important question. Uh, speaker, the future of work is here, and our jobs have all changed dramatically. This is why our government is taking action to ensure these changes are working for workers. Yesterday, I was proud to rise in this legislature and introduce the Working for Workers Act. People are more than their jobs. They are mums and dads community volunteers, members of faith communities, and so much more. Our legislation makes it crystal clear. When you're off the clock, you're off the clock. We're standing up for workers, and especially after the last 19 months, our workers need a break. And a supplementary. Thank you, Minister, for that response. And Mr. Speaker, we have seen a disturbing trend on the rise with more big corporations using non-compete agreements to hold workers back and stifle our homegrown talent. And recently, I read that tech salaries in Toronto are only about 65% of the average U.S. tech salary. And I believe there is absolutely no reason for workers here in Ontario to be vastly underpaid compared to their American counterparts. Can the minister share how our government is tackling this trend and freeing workers to advance their careers? Minister Labour. Thank you again uh, to, member, to the member for that. A speaker, our Working for Workers Act will ban non-compete agreements. They are an injustice and they have no place in Ontario. Banning these agreements will also help us attract top talent to strengthen our economy. And Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to say uh, that we received uh, the support this morning of 1,600 tech companies, mostly small uh, and medium size, uh, supporting this initiative. Mr. Speaker, we're also leveling the playing field to help grow the innovative ideas that are being developed here in Ontario's backyard. Speaker, Ontario is a province of opportunity where hard work pays off and big dreams come to life. Our government has a plan to build the future of our great province, and we're taking the side of workers. Thank you. The next question, the member for Algoma, Manitoulin. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Drive test is currently facing a backlog of 700,000 tests. This is forcing people to wait months' ends to book an appointment. With the provincial order extending G1s and G2 licenses set to expire in a few months, Ontarians are scrambling to book an appointment only to find that there are none available. For many, driving is how we get to things like groceries, school, to work, to doctor appointments. This is especially true for those living in rural and northern Ontario. This backlog is clearly not sustainable. It will further hinder Ontario's economic recovery, and it increasingly adds stress on hard-working Ontario families. Will the Premier tell the people of Ontario what the government is doing to address the growing backlog in drive tests across Ontario? The Associate Minister of Transportation. 
Uh, thank you very much, Speaker, and I appreciate the question from the member opposite. This is an important issue, and drive test backlogs are something that people are suffering from. I, I can relate to their frustration throughout this pandemic, a very difficult time, and that's why we're attacking the problem at its source from the beginning. In June, of course, we, we did uh, announce a $16 million plan with 251 additional drivers, but the member asked specifically about the North, and I'm happy to, to say that there are programs tailored towards the unique needs of the North. There are 27 uh, travel point locations providing services on a part-time basis. In northern communities, that make up 43% of the drive test network. And under this new plan to help address the backlog in the north, every drive test location in northern Ontario will receive at least one additional drive examiner. This is expected to increase testing capacity in the region by approximately 150%. I appreciate the member's concern. We have to address this backlog. We're going to make sure we get that done and get back to prosperity here in Ontario. Thank you. The supplementary question. Again to the Premier. Backlog for drivers' tests were an issue in the North before COVID-19. Now the number of people waiting to get tests has reached a crisis level in the North. Despite this, the government has not opened a single new testing location in Northern Ontario. This is affecting residents in my riding like Charlie Wardell from Thessalon, who is struggling to book a G test before his license expires, and he is forced to start the process over again. Or Norm Lacroix, a business, a bus uh, dealership owner, who needs new bus drivers in Chapleau. Tests are backed up to the point where they cannot book an appointment until December of 2022, others 2024. As the member for Sudbury said recently, the North is where we use highways to get to work, Question. not subways. This backlog is causing major, major disruptions to everyday life in the North. Will the Premier commit to opening more drive test locations in Northern Ontario to ensure no one loses their license because they cannot book a test? And the Associate Minister of Transportation. Uh, thank you, Speaker. And I'm glad the member referenced the uh, question from the member from Sudbury last week because he's right. Uh, the, unique had, the North has unique challenges. And to Charlie and Nord, coming out of this very difficult 19 months, we understand the frustration of trying to get through these backlogs because the North relies on these types of, uh, of, of programs to be able to out there to live their day, daily lives, Speaker. And that's why, specifically to the North, we have allocated additional resources to make sure that every drive test location in the North will receive one additional drive tester speaker. This is also part of a bigger plan to go after the highest volume areas where these backlogs are being created. Speaker, we are going to address this problem, and, and I appreciate Charlie and Nord are going through a very difficult time, so I will say directly to them, once we're through this backlog, you will find that we will return to the normal status of life and keep the northern locations in, in, in Dryden, Espinola, Fort Francis, Kapiskasing, Kamara, Sudbury, Thunder Bay, Timmins, making sure that we have year-round access to get those drive tests on, done and get back onto the road. Thank you. The next question, the member for Scarborough Guildwood. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. When you sent thousands of students back to packed classrooms this fall, you claimed that schools had what they needed to keep our children safe. We were led to believe that the fourth wave of the COVID-19 pandemic would not be the same as the waves that came before, that the government had learned from its mistakes and that parents could expect learning gaps in their children's education to shrink, not expand. The reality, however, is alarming. In my riding of Scarborough Guildwood, parents and teachers are telling me that conditions have not improved. Schools do not have portable schools do have portable air filters, but the other COVID measures that we know work to limit the spread of COVID-19 are absent. The latest school in my riding to face a COVID outbreak is Cedarbrook Collegiate. That's five schools now in my riding that have had to deal with an outbreak, and many people fear that there will be more, Question. as infection rates in schools is nearly one in four of COVID cases. Speaker, last wave, the Minister of Health prioritized vaccine hotspots during the early stages of our vaccination program. Will the minister do the same for vaccinations for our children so that they can get the vaccine as soon as it is approved? And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you very much, Speaker, and thank you to the member for the question. We are working to protect all children in school. We already have 
the uh, vaccinations for students aged 12 to 17, but for those in elementary school, we're waiting for the uh, results from Health Canada for approval of the use of the vaccine for children ages 5 to 11. We are already putting a plan in place. We are not waiting. We will be ready to go as soon as this has been approved by Health Canada. We've already been in touch with the Chief Medical Officers of Health in the 34 Ontario regions. We have their plans. The plans differ according to the various uh, units, depending on what's available, but uh, we are reviewing their plans right now and making sure that in all 34 of those regions, they will be ready to go as soon as the vaccine is approved. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Ontarians have sacrificed a lot in this pandemic, especially in hotspot communities in my riding of Scarborough Guildwood. We've done our part to get the vaccinate, to get people vaccinated and to follow recommendations and guidelines in hopes that 2022 will not look like 2019 and 2020. And the sacrifices will not end until the remaining percentage of the unvaccinated gets even smaller. A significant portion of this unvaccinated group, as you know, are those who are not eligible presently, our children under age 12. And this group will be soon eligible based on the fact that Health Canada is now reviewing the one approved vaccine for that age group. The federal government has pre-ordered 2.9 million doses, Minister. You say you have a plan, and I'm wondering if you will share that plan today with this legislature on what you will be doing to make sure sure. that the unvaccinated under 12 are done as quickly as possible and that there is equity built into that so that hotspot communities where the virus continues to spread receives prioritization and that you coordinate with school boards so that clinics are actually Thank you. <laughs> the school of health. Much. In fact, there are 34 different plans because there are 34 public health unit regions within Ontario. They vary depending what resources are available within their units, but we are working with them directly right now. Schools, as you indicated, are likely to be a major place where the vaccinations will occur, not necessarily within school hours because most parents of children of that age would like to be with their child when they receive the vaccine, but in evenings and weekends, that's likely to be a major location. Some will be done in primary care as well. But there is a plan. It is being finalized right now so that as soon as the uh, Health Canada advises that it's all right to move forward, we will be getting those vaccines uh, out to the local public health units and start that right away. Based on the success of our adult vaccination program, uh, people can rest assured Response. that we will have bring the same rigor to the vaccination of children as well. Thank you. The next question is the member for Carleton. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. When our government came to power in 2018, we immediately began cleaning up the mess left by the previous government. Over 15 years, we saw education neglected as schools closed all over our province. And with the COVID-19 pandemic, the delivery of education in Ontario and across the globe has been severely impacted. School boards, educators, students, and their families in my riding of Carleton have demonstrated resiliency and flexibility in responding to changes in their learning environments and have come a long way in embracing new ways of teaching, learning, and connecting. Through you, Mr. Speaker, can the Minister of Education tell us how our government plans to right the wrongs of the previous government and ensure that there are enough schools to meet the needs of Ontarians? To apply, the Minister of Education. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member of Carleton for being a strong advocate for her families, for delivering new schools for the next generation of residents in the Ottawa region. And Mr. Speaker, our government under the Premier's leadership is absolutely committed to rebuilding schools after a decade of darkness under the former Liberal government, where 600 schools closed, with the repair backlog increased by over 15 billion dollars. Mr. Speaker, that is unacceptable. We know we can do better. Our kids deserve better, which is why our government is allocated over half a billion dollars each and every year to rebuild schools, to build new schools, modern, accessible, technologically connected for all children in the province. In fact, Speaker, there are over 150 projects that have been approved by this progressive Conservative government. There's over 300 schools and child care projects that are currently underway, under construction, and I'm proud to highlight two, Speaker. The first is in Etobicoke. For the Bishop Allen Academy, there are two members from Etobicoke who have helped deliver a brand new Catholic high school Spons. for families in that community. And likewise, in Halton, the new North Oakville Catholic Elementary School that will help support children in growing communities right across this province. Hmm. And the supplementary question. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and through you. This is excellent news. I'm really glad to learn that new schools are coming for these communities, especially after the previous government failed to support students across the province. Mr. Speaker, thousands of families outside of the GTHA depend on us. They are counting on our government to deliver high-quality, world-class education to their children for decades to come. Can the Minister of Education tell us how our government plans to invest in the next generation of Ontarians beyond the GTA? Thank you. Mr. Education. Well, thank you, Speaker. I think it's fair to say that families in rural, remote parts of Ontario and, and families that live outside the GTHA also deserve these modern schools, accessible schools. Uh, we absolutely would agree, especially noting the equity disparity that took place with the former government, where many of our rural schools and communities outside of Toronto just didn't get the investment they deserve. And that's why I'm proud that the member from Carleton has delivered the new Riverside South Public Secondary School in Carleton, delivering parents and young children in those communities a state-of-the-art a state school. Likewise, Speaker, in in Brantford. Our hardworking member is delivered the new St. Charles Catholic Elementary School that will support Stop families in that community. And in the Premier's uh, community, uh, the Premier's commitment to the people of Essex is to build a new Kingsville Public Elementary and Secondary School that's going to make a big difference for families in, West, in Windsor. Speaker, we are investing in all regions of Ontario with one commitment to Response. ensure schools are modern, kids are safe, and they continue to learn each and every day. Next question, member for Humber River, Black Creek. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Premier, a 77-year-old senior in my community desperately needs your help. Since June four months ago, Joyce has been un unable to eat solids and is vomiting constantly, becoming more and more frail and sick. Joyce requires a specialized CT scan to find out what's going on and figure out how to treat it. But because of the long wait list, she will have to wait until December. Even worse, Joyce's daughter experienced the same symptoms only to later find out she had esophageal cancer, a cancer that claimed her life. May she rest in peace. Premier, I know all of this through Joyce's family because she is in no state to talk to me. Imagine what this family is going through. They're desperately awaiting the scan and are fearing the window might close on potentially life-saving treatment as the clock ticks away. Premier, time is of the essence. Will you help Joyce and countless others who are desperately stuck awaiting urgent scans, procedures, and surgeries. And to reply, the Minister of Health. Thank you. Well, thank you, Speaker, and thank you to the member for this important question. We know that people like Joyce have been anxiously awaiting surgeries and diagnostic procedures from t for some time as a result of COVID, where we've had to uh, delay or, or uh, postpone some of these procedures. But we are very cognizant of the issues here. We want to get people back into good health and to uh, make sure that we can diagnose any illnesses before they advance uh, further. So that's why, as part of our $1.8 billion investment into hospitals, we uh, are also dedicating $300 million to reduce, uh, to reduce the wait list for surgeries and procedures, and that's in addition to the $200 million we announced last fall to deal with some of these procedures because we know that people have been waiting long enough. We know that they need um, surgeries and, and, and the diagnostic Response. procedures as well so that Joyce and her family can get the results that they need and get her hopefully back on the road to wellness. Thank you. Supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. Back to the Acting Premier. And, and I hope that your government will move quick because time is really of the essence in Joyce's case and so many others. But as well, backlogs and long wait lists aren't the only problems in healthcare today. We just don't have enough frontline healthcare workers in our hospitals and our communities. It makes the work of our frontline healthcare heroes even harder and has a direct impact on patient care. Yesterday, the Ontario NDP tabled a vital motion addressing the nursing shortage, but the government voted against it. Other provinces have taken real action to deal with this issue. Why won't you? Help. Thank you. Well, we certainly recognize the uh, health human resource issue, which is one of the reasons why we're uh, treading very carefully and really reviewing carefully the issue of uh, mandatory vaccination for frontline health care workers. We know that many people on the front line have been working over the last 20 months. Some of them are exhausted. Some of them don't want to continue. Some of them don't want to proceed with vaccination. So we need to look at that very, very cautiously. But we are spending money. We are looking at retraining people, making 
make sure that we keep people into the uh, nursing and other professions, making sure that we have the laddering prospects so that if somebody is a personal support worker and wants to become a registered practical nurse or a registered practical nurse that wishes to become a registered nurse, we're putting those systems in place so that people can do that because we want people, whatever their entry point is in working in the healthcare system, to stay in the healthcare system and to look forward. So some people may be happy where they are, other people may want to advance. We recognize that and we're creating programs to train people and keep people Respond. in those programs and to train people for the higher levels in terms of surgery, intensive care and emergency work as well. Thank you. The next question, the member for Cambridge. Speaker, good morning. My question is for the Deputy Premier. Last week, after government members said in this legislature during debate what the government has been doing for weeks, pushing and supporting employers in health care to end the employment of those workers who do not comply with new mandatory COVID-19 vaccine policies. Government members then reversed course, followed my lead, and voted against Bill 12, which would have resulted in many losing their jobs in Ontario in health care and education. So why yesterday was it reported that this government is still considering putting such a mandate in place in health care that will result in Ontarians losing their jobs? Why, if the government voted against Bill 12, will they not reject COVID-19 vaccine mandates in order for one to keep their job in health care? Minister of Health. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, thank you to the member for the question. I, we've, uh, dealt with this issue several times today in the legislature, and there is an issue, as you know, with respect to health human resources and uh, making sure that we have the people that we need in order to care for people in our hospitals and in home care as well. So it is something that we need to consider very carefully. That is why the Premier sent the letter out to the hospitals, to other health care organizations, to understand what the ramifications would be if we were to bring in a mandatory vaccination policy. How many people would we lose? As the previous uh, question indicated, we are in a health human resource shortage right now, and we need to uh, carefully look at this situation to understand what it means in terms of people who, who are not being vaccinated, uh, who still have to be tested on a regular basis before they come into work. But this isn't a simple question, and it deserves the proper scrutiny. Supplementary question. Thank you. Also, last week, the Minister of Labour said we have a labour shortage of some 293,000 jobs, and so he proposed making it easier for immigrants, as opposed to any other Ontarian, to get licensed in certain professions by removing work experience requirements. And yet, this government is the one making the labour shortage worse by allowing for and encouraging employers to terminate employees who do not comply with made-up mandatory vaccine requirements. In just some examples, Construction, Alistair, PCL announced mandatory COVID-19 vaccine requirements for employment. At Sick Kids, 147 employees have been put on unpaid leave, and at University Health Network, 1% of their workforce will be terminated. To the Deputy Premier, why is this government allowing policies to be put in place that have Ontarians losing their jobs, all while the Minister of Labour is making it easier for immigrants to be licensed professionals in Ontario by eliminating the work experience Question. requirements that every other Ontarian had to do to get the same job? Minister of Labour. Well, thank you very much, and I thank the uh, member uh, opposite, uh, and she is right. We are moving forward to fill uh, the labour shortages uh, here in the province uh, of Ontario. Uh, Mr. Speaker, um, I, I think often of the opportunities uh, in the skilled trades. One in three journey persons today uh, is over the age of uh, 55. We have this uh, challenge uh, in front of us with um, all of these workers are retiring. That's why we want to uh, get more people uh, into the skilled trades, into these meaningful uh, opportunities with six figures, with defined pensions and benefits. This is how we're going to build back uh, a stronger uh, province. And Mr. Speaker, we are going to level the playing field uh, for the people of Ontario and for uh, immigrants that are already here, uh, actually. In fact, uh, Mr. Speaker, 25 per cent of immigrants that live in Ontario are actually working uh, in fields that they've uh, studied for. Many of them, as we all know, have been driving a taxi for many, many years. We're going to ensure that all licensing requirements are in place, all the proper testing uh, protocols, and we're going to give these people a handout that they deserve. Next question, the member for London Fanshawe. Thank you, Speaker. And my question is to the Premier. Brent Davis is a Fanshawe College student in London. He has autism, depression, anxiety, and OCD. 
When his apartment burnt down last August, he and his mom, Jay's Lynn, found out how difficult it is to actually find affordable housing in London. His sole income is ODSP, which means he has to live on about $1,100 a month. He was paying $700 a month in rent, and that means he has $400 left for other expenses. Imagine more than 60 percent of your income just to put a roof over your head. After reaching out to nine agencies, none of which who could provide meaningful help, Brent has now found a home through a flu. Luke, Jaislyn's mother, a friend, was able to offer assistance. In London, the average rent for a room is $500 and $1,000 for a studio apartment. On the current rate for OW and ODSP, how are Ontarians supposed to live? And will this government commit to raising rates for OW and ODSP? The Parliamentary Assistant Member for Ottawa, West Nepean. Thank you so much, Speaker, uh, and I appreciate the question from the member opposite. Uh, our hearts, of course, go out to, uh, to Mr. Davis on, uh, on the tragedy that occurred uh, at his home. Uh, in terms of uh, government support for individuals with uh, disabilities, our government raised ODSP and Ontario work rates in the first year that we took government. And during the COVID-19 pandemic, knowing the challenges posed by the pandemic, we invested more than $1 billion in the Social Services Relief Fund and expanded access to temporary emergency assistance to those in financial crisis. We are going to continue supporting those who are most vulnerable, uh, including through this work, and we're going to be there throughout the pandemic and beyond. Thank you, Speaker. Supplementary question. Speaker. Premier. Brent is not alone. According to the latest Vital Signs report for London, 77 per cent of low-income uh, tenants surveyed reported their rental units needed significant repairs, while the average price of rent has increased 7 per cent. As of September, over 1,300 people are experiencing homelessness, and 6,000 folks are on a wait list for social housing. Brent's own to, is on two wait lists for housing, one for two years and the other nearly five years. When Jaislyn reached out for assistance, some of the programs told her that because Brent was able to stay with her while looking for housing, they weren't able to help. So, because Brent, w Brent was so desperate, he went to the newspaper to get some help. Brent doesn't want to be in this situation going forward, and he wasn't eligible service Question. simply because living with his mother. Why must Ontarians be in crisis before that they are supported, and what are we doing to help Ontarians so they don't end up on the streets? The parliamentary assistant. Thank you so much, Speaker. And our government is committed to ensuring that we are reforming and revitalizing these vital services that Ontarians rely on. We know that Ontario Works and the ODSP program are critical to helping those uh, who are most in need. The system itself is facing challenges that limit our ability to help people get back on their feet, and the COVID-19 pandemic has exasperated those challenges. That's why we are currently working with our municipal partners and developing a shared vision for social assistance for the future. The focus of this vision is on the people we serve and how we can connect them to supports that respond to their unique needs and the barriers they face. This vision will ensure frontline workers have more time to focus on connecting clients with supports like job readiness programs, housing, childcare, skills training, and mental health services. This vision is the start of our collaboration not the end, and we will continue to work with our partners across the sector to improve this system for the future. Thank you, Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa, Vanier. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and my question is for the Minister of Labour, Training and Skills Development. Uh, I have heard from many new Canadians who are qualified to work in jobs which are in high demand, but they can't work in their field. Lawyers, engineers, doctors, and recently I've heard from a highly qualified francophone teacher from France who ended up going to work in Quebec because she couldn't find a job in Ontario. She wanted to teach in Ontario, but the rules and processes for the certification from the Ontario College of Teachers were so complicated and slow that she simply gave up. With Ontario facing a critical shortage of French teachers, we should be simplifying our rules to make it easier for immigrants to become teachers in our province. The recent professional registration and licensing changes announced by the government don't go far enough. 
What additional plan Question. does the government have for allowing more teachers, particularly francophone teachers, to come to Ontario and practice their profession? Minister of Education. Mr. Officer, for the question, we are aware of a long-standing challenge nationally of hiring and recruiting and retaining French language educators in Ontario. It is a real crisis because we have great growth within our Francophone communities and, by extension, within our schools. We announced a collaborative, uh, enterprise-wide uh, policy, uh, French language recruitment and retention strategy for educators that has uh, already yielded since its announcement in June. New educators recruited internationally, including from France. We announced this just last week with the Consul General uh, from France, as well as my colleague, the Minister of Francophonie and the Parliamentary Assistant, the Minister of Education, all of whom celebrate the fact that we already have internationally trained educators from France and the broader Francophonie in this province educating as we speak. Clearly, we have to do more. Uh, we have to support the sector, which is why increased funding for French language education at the highest levels ever recorded Response. in national history. Uh, I recognize where we have to do, um, continue to work hard, which is why we've allocated over $19 million in education alone, specifically targeted to the recruitment of educators and the reduction of red tape at the Ontario College of Teachers. And the supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I do appreciate the response from the minister and that efforts are being made. However, the only major changes that brought the government brought forward is the elimination of the requirement to have work experience in Canada. But that ignores the heart of the problem, which is that professional bodies refuse to recognize such certifications from other jurisdictions or to enable training for immigrants to renew their skills. We are in an urgent shortage of healthcare and education professionals, and we have trained doctors and teachers driving taxis and working checkout counters. The bill I will be introducing this afternoon lays a path for identifying certification issues and develop a strategy. I invite you to consider it. So my question is, will the government commit to an expansion of recognition of the, the diplomas from other jurisdictions? Mr. Labour. Well, thank you uh, very much, and this is a, a really important uh, question. Mr. Speaker, uh, yesterday uh, we tabled the uh, Working uh, for Workers Act, uh, Mr. Speaker, that's going to create a clear path for new Canadians to find meaningful work uh, here uh, in Ontario to fully uh, apply their skills. Mr. Speaker, this will help uh, thousands and thousands of uh, new Canadians that are actually here uh, in Ontario today. But, Mr. Speaker, this is an issue that the former Liberal government did nothing to address. Today in the province, 300,000 jobs are going unfilled. Only 25 per cent of immigrants are working uh, in their field of study, Mr. Speaker. This is an injustice to uh, all of those people, Mr. Speaker, that are here uh, in Ontario today that Fox? might be you know, working for Uber, driving taxi. They should be doing uh, what they were trained for. So, Mr. Speaker, we're going, we're going to help them, give them a hand up, and also ensure that we fill the labour shortage. Thank you very much. That concludes our question period this morning. And I want to, if I can for a moment, thank the House for the cooperation that we demonstrated to each other today and the, civility, the standard of civility that was achieved. Well done. There being no further business at this time, this House stands in recess until 3 p.m.